architecture, um, but she's also um, a practicing architect of, uh, with award-winning uh, buildings, um, and with a particular interest in um, sustainable buildings and also community-based uh, projects as well. Um, so, over to you, Chris. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yes, I also am very impressed, I'm sure a lot of people have said this, that you're using a week of your holidays. I even emailed Cathy and said, Cathy, this is the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, um, do interrupt me. Uh, as we're winding down, uh, well, not winding down, as it was one of the last, I, I tried to put as many images in uh, as I can. I was scrabbling around, because I was away last week actually, trying to find lots of student images, I didn't do that brilliantly actually to do it, but I've tried to show, and of course of, uh, of things we've been doing, but, um, but I've shown very specific images, I've tried to show, um, uh, for those of you who aren't architects or in the kind of built environment, actually I wonder if you could just, uh, put, who is either architecture, landscape or planning? So that's quite a lot of you, and I, I, I just was alerted to that. So I hope you don't find this a little bit obvious, you know, in some of the things I'm going to say. But anyway, hopefully it, it will um, remind you. I'm trying to make this talk quite practical. Um, I hope it might give your forming ideas uh, that you're in the middle of uh, your projects that you're doing, some tips, maybe in processes. Um, and overall, what I'm wanting to argue is that we need to be more ambitious um, we need to aim a bit higher uh, when building a new community. And, and maybe I've taken much more than any of the other talks building a new community quite literally. Um, or in my case, and a lot of the work I've done over the last uh, 10 years is, uh, is visioning neighbourhoods and neighbourhood planning with communities. Um, the talk is going to discuss the importance um, that, uh, of utopias, for, or maybe not the importance, but, but using the concept, the much contested concept, uh, uh, concept of utopias as inspiration in what is definitely, I think, what we're all kind of uh, very familiar with now, um, the social production of space, the first concept of social production of space and the creation of sustainable communities. I mention, uh, I mention politics quite a lot because in everything that I do, politics is absolutely fundamental within it. <clears throat> so over the last 10 years, and, and uh, in fact more than 10 years, in both my own architectural practice and postgraduate design studio, we've explored processes that work with big societal and policy issues to promote dialogue and collaboration through processes and, and through co-production, building ambitious narratives and future scenarios and then testing them. In some cases, uh, things have actually materialized, in our own work, things have actually materialized. Uh, in some, they remain ideas. Uh, any kind of work with communities, uh, in any of you who've actually done it, some of you will have done it, can be uh, very frustrating uh, because, not because of the communities you're working with, because of the, uh, the whole context, the political context behind it, and the short-termism that's involved in it. Anything to do with building a community is long-term. Involving people in the process is at the heart of the change that is needed in building uh, this idea of a sustainable community or neighbourhood. Now, I just wanted to say, I suggested the, the great transition to you uh, because I felt, and I don't know if any of you already know it, um, uh, but in essence, it's a manifesto. It's a grand narrative. It's a tale, of, and it says on the second page, of how it turns out right. Uh, it talks about different ways of doing things, new economic priorities, different priorities, the priorities we've got today. Putting people and the planet first, and I'm quoting <clears throat> from it. In a way, it is a kind of utopia in itself or a message to us on how to build a sustainable community for the future. Uh, it's about working together. It's about interdependence. Um, it's about co-production. It's about global interdependence, which clearly we are a global community. And it's about working locally. 
Uh, in fact, it's about all the big challenges of today that require revaluing, redistribution, localization, engagement. There's nothing actually specifically about architecture in it, but it is, I think, one of the best documents written that comes out of the New Economics Foundation to actually lay a kind of social and political um, manifesto together of, of how we need to change. So I just wanted to say a little bit about myself um, and why I'm here and the context behind the work. Uh, my passion as a teacher and as an architect is, um, and I'm unapologetic about this, is to promote and encourage people to be interested in and understand the role of design. And the role of design is fundamental to society, not as a kind of add-on, which so often design is considered as. Um, and, uh, and this is at every scale. Uh, from regional scale down to tiny detailed scale. Uh, over the last 10 years, um, I've done a lot of what you might call action research. Uh, I set up something called the Bureau of Design Research, which has become almost impossible in today's university and political climate. But we've done a lot of kind of research consultancy with communities and for communities, giving them access to an involvement in design thinking. And in turn, um, we have reciprocally, and re reciprocation is a really important word that I use, everything we do is reciprocal. We uh, give ideas and, uh, and listen, and communities and residents give ideas and listen. And the really important thing about engagement with people um, is to be reciprocal about it. I've learned an awful lot about the way people want to live and what their ideas and inspirations and aspirations are. We've done in the Bureau over like 80 projects and I'm about, I'm about 75, haven't been written up yet. So uh, that's what I'm trying to do now on a sabbatical. And so um, just uh, it's easiest to get into diagram form. Uh, so in a way, uh, what I want to talk about um, in this uh, lecture is how you, and you as really engaged students, um, uh, in a way um, you'll all be doing some kind of actual research during your degrees, and I want to blur the distinction between teaching and research and actually practice, actually getting out there and being active. I've tried to maintain a small practice while I've been uh, teaching and doing consultancy and some research. And it doesn't really matter whether you're working on a tiny project with an individual or whether you're working with a whole community or a whole group of um, slightly disenfranchised teenagers. Um, it's understanding the context with which you're building. Um, so I'm an architect and I'm a professional. Perhaps that um, makes me slightly different from uh, some of the other um, academics who've listened. Not that they're not. Um, very professional in their outlook, but I really feel myself more as a professional than an academic still. <clears throat> and as a professional, we speak our own language, and we're not always very clear about what we're doing and why we're doing things. We don't really communicate well enough <clears throat> about our processes. And when we do, it can be very powerful. Um, it's very important that we learn how to exchange ideas. And the role of the architect is changing a lot in society and very much for the good. Uh, and I think this David Harvey quote really kind of sums it up. I'm usually in the position of telling kind of proto-architects that architecture is a product of culture and society of the time. And everything we act upon and think about comes from this wider dimension whether through the history of ideas, which is what I teach at uh, undergraduate level, or through contemporary cultural or scientific or political ideas. I hope this talk will show you how important the political and cultural setting is to anything that an architect does. <coughs> but today I want to come from the other side and tell non-architects, and that's why I didn't realize so many of you are involved in kind of uh, uh, the built environment, but really I was thinking I was largely um, telling non-architects how we feel as architects and how we're beginning to and should operate in the world. And why, as I said, design is, is important in everything we do and how architecture can help build <coughs> this elusive, sustainable community. 
Um, to just give an example that I read in actually a planning book called Culture and Planning that's written by a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, I think this is a really good quote on uh, how professionals uh, neglect sometimes to listen to people. Uh, a, a lady who was part of a kind of participatory group said, um, has anyone thought about the wind on North, in Norfolk Park? Because it gets really windy here. And uh, sort of this general sort of murmur, yes, of course, everyone knows about wind, you know, Sheffield's really windy, it's kind of hilly. Um, and she extracted from this, I, I thought I couldn't, I couldn't really say this better, so I'm quoting her. Professionals are trained to be aware of statements that fall within their knowledge field and to prioritise the factors that they have the skills to manage. Indeed, this is part of what our training aims to achieve. The ability to sift out significant information. The trouble is, these skills are not fail-safe, but can often lead us to missing crucial information which lies on the fringes beyond or between professional fields. This means that when people talk to us about issues that are not within our professional field, their comments can seem to pass unnoticed. From the perspective of residents concerned about local conditions, it can often seem there is no legitimate arena to discuss really important issues for them. Um, we need to know more about and be more aware of the different cultures, for example, in, in Sheffield. I really love this image um, of a little project we did for a sort of youth shelter uh, in a little pocket park as part of this big North Sheffield project I'm going to talk about. Um, the kind of answers we got from these children were things that we just couldn't have second guessed at all. We need to be creative in everything to do in order to develop this reciprocal learning, the relationship between the professional and the client, the user and the resident, the interested party. Now, um, just very, very briefly as well on, on um, interdisciplinarity, uh, I think it's fantastic uh, uh, that you're all here to work in an interdisciplinary way. And I've started to do that in the last few years in a number of research projects that I'm working on. Um, so in, in that way, I, it's a real privilege for me to be talking to you in this kind of interdisciplinary forum because it is the way forward. Um, and I think one of your other um, uh, speakers, um, uh, Tim Chico, might have mentioned C.P. Snow's lecture, The Two Cultures. It's always something I felt very, very aware of in my undergraduate lectures that, uh, that we still haven't quite managed to get to that pre-enlightenment idea that everything is actually about politics and philosophy, whether it's science or whether it's humanities. Um, but we're not exclusively defined by our disciplines. We have overlapping identities, uh, we have different social, racial, sexual, religious, intellectual and political ideas. So when we participate in public debate, we're not just architects or physicists. Um, or philosophers. Uh, perhaps um, you who are not architecture students will think of architecture, and I'm sure you're far more sophisticated than this, as a kind of technocratic, because I've come across it a lot, and even with my colleagues at the university, a kind of engineering-based technocratic enterprise. Um, or one about expediency and practicality and learning to build. Um, and I think in a way we've almost gone the other way now and we're uh, certainly in, in our department here in the university we are very, very much about social production. But I hope this talk is going to show you that we are multidisciplinary, we work in an interdisciplinary way and this can be at the core uh, of how, again, we try and build these sustainable communities. Um, Working interdisciplinary is really difficult. Now, this was the first, I just, this is the first project I want to tell you about. This is a research project I'm doing with the physics department and the geography department, uh, and with a geographer who's now at Durham. And um, 
And I'm introducing it because it's an example of I got my students involved in this project, my MR students involved in this project as well. Uh, it's trying, it's doing something really rather difficult. If I had any idea how difficult it was, I wouldn't have got involved in this project. Um, we are trying to involve a community, and we've got a lot of money from the EPS hosting to do it, um, in the production and understanding of scientific processes. Uh, and those particular processes are solar, uh, a future of solar power. Um, what we're really trying to do is what I've already said. We're trying to listen uh, to the processes of science, us as professionals and residents are also professionals from different, uh, not, uh, you know, or, um, people from many different uh, arenas in, in life. We're trying to kind of uh, expose the scientific processes of solar production and to have this reciprocal relationship with, uh, with the community. And that community is in Stocksbridge. Um, it requires, and this is another thing about uh, talking about sustainable communities. We're usually talking about the future. Re research in the future is actually a really difficult thing to do because it hasn't happened yet. It's an unknown future. It's an unknown quantity. It's not the near or the deep past, which is more common and more fruitful in some ways to research because there's material there to reflect on. Um, this session here that you're looking at, and I happen to be right on the axis of it, and uh, I think I was talking at the time this photograph was taking, I was trying to explain to this group of people, and I'm one of six people, we're all sitting mixed with the community, about how we don't know all the answers. And that really, that really floored this group of people to start with. They thought, well, why, why are you here? You know, you're from the university, you haven't got all the answers. We were saying, we want to come with ideas, and we want your... Um, and we want your ideas. And um, uh, once they got used to that idea, you know, we had to we had to say we're not the people who know everything. And actually, we we've worked very hard to plan these sessions, uh, and they do take a lot of time to plan. But they might go wrong, and we might not be doing it right. And and you could tell them, oh my God, you're at the university. You should you should know what you're doing. Um, and a lot of what building sustainability and building a relationship with communities about is admitting that we don't actually always know what we're doing. So this session, this first session, and we're having another one this week, took many, many hours of a research, full-time researcher's time, two full-time researchers' time planning. We put on exhibitions in order to get these people interested in this project and committed uh, to coming to a number of future events. And this is where the power comes. These people have committed to coming to a whole series of events over a year uh, and working with us for nothing in order to have this reciprocal relationship with us. And that's, that's how powerful it can be. And, I, and I'm talking about this one because I'll come back to it when I talk about one of the students' uh, projects. Um, the people involved in this are everyone from someone from Tata Steel, um, who the people have taken over from Chorus, the big steel works in Stocksbridge. But Stocksbridge is a very eccentric kind of place. Um, this, this is the students presenting their work to um, the researchers doing it and bringing their project into, um, uh, it, it, from the studio into a research project. They then showed their work to the residents in Stocksbridge as part of this possible new future for Stocksbridge. And we chose Stocksbridge uh, because we'd done this project, this year-long MArch project there. Um, the project was about uh, transforming the place. It's a very beleaguered place. The, the steel industry is still there, which is unusual, but... Um, uh, already there are enormous problems because uh, the swimming pool, I don't know if you know, loads of things uh, are now being closed down in Sheffield and two of the most contentious are the athletic stadium obviously and the Don Valley and the swimming pool and, and uh, sports facility in, in um, Stocksbridge and so immediately the Stocksbridge residents want us to get involved in that and if we could make that a sustainable uh, solar powered building, could we save it? 
Uh, and then the UKIP party got involved and wanted to become involved in the project. And as researchers, we have to say we can't get politically involved on that level. Uh, and so already, you, when you're actually out there working with communities, you realise the difficulty, the importance, and the, and the contentious uh, nature of it. Um, just before I go on to show, and I'm nearly at the end of the um, uh, sort of setting the scene for, for the work and talking about the project, I want to just talk about community a little bit as a concept. Um, community is, is a word we all use a lot of the time, and I'm sure many people have been defining it over the last few days. Um, it's a shifting concept, and it's a contentious one politically, and it's being used politically, and I'm sure you've heard that in the last few days. The coalition government are using the word community uh, a lot. Um, Sigmund Bauman, the sociologist, uh, I think uh, he's written this rather wonderful essay, Community Seeking Safety in an Insecure World, and he talks of community being elusive, Community feels good because of the meanings the word, the very word conveys. It's warm and cosy, it's sort of comfortable. It's like a fireplace, we warm our hands on a frosty day. And Raymond Williams talks about our shared condition, observed caustically, that the remarkable thing about community is it's always been. We may add that it is always in the future. When we talk about a community, uh, we're always thinking about how the community can develop. Community is nowadays another name for paradise lost, but one which we hope to return to. And so we feverishly seek the roads that may bring us there. And what smells trouble for this cloudless image is another difference. That difference between the community of our dreams and the reality that really exists. And I think that sums up really what I've been saying. And then my colleague, Doina, said uh, something which can't really be bettered in terms of maybe what we as architects are about, which is that making community and making space for community can't be separated, because community has to inhabit space. I'll just put these in to start talking about, because at, at the back of everything we're doing, we're getting these kind of policy statements and then rather interesting statements uh, sort of that uh, become quoted, particularly like the one the Shadow Housing Minister at the time, uh, when he said this, all the low flush toilets in the world can't make dumping a housing state on green fields somehow eco-friendly, and goes on and it's in the context of building new neighbourhoods and new communities. <coughs> So the main point I want to argue today, I'm sure I'll just go back to that, is that there are two directions we need to come from to build a sustainable community. And one is what I've been talking about so far, is from a community-involved perspective, finding methods of working with communities. Uh, until a community is involved, they can't get any kind of ownership over a project at all. Uh, and this is often talked about as the kind of bottom-up or a maybe a tactical approach. And the second is a more strategic view, not just professional, but visionary. And this is where I think we need to aim higher. We need big ideas again, even utopian ideas. Uh, we need, um, in the great sort of modernist terminology, a grand narrative. Uh, and that grand narrative doesn't have to be overwhelming and, and, and overarching, it can, be, it can actually be quite tiny as well. Uh, but all those kind of tiny ideas build to a big uh, narrative for the future. An ideal concept that we need to be ambitious about before, inevitably, when building happens, the compromise begins. In my experience of many years of working with communities, uh, people respond to big ideas. It takes them out of their their own environment and allows them to dream. Uh, but if those ideas are well formulated and well researched and well discussed, uh, they can also be highly relevant. So, and I'm not sure if you can read this, I'm sorry about the quality of, of this slide. Um, I want to sort of just let you in to the kind of methodology that I've been using 
uh, with my student, my MArch studio. Uh, before I show you project, I'm going to show you two student projects and how they have related to and are very much involved with the last sort of four projects, which are projects that we've done. Um, this, uh, uh, this slide talks about uh, and very much influenced by um, the New Economics Foundation, um, the Great Transition in a way, that we need, when we're thinking about a design project, to think about change and change for the future. Um, and so the kind of ways we do that is by mapping and using that not just to map information that's physical but non-physical information that can become a kind of transformative tool for the future. Uh, we need to work interdisciplinary with lots of other people, everyone from sociologists to engineers um, uh, to uh, all sorts of people who uh, might have some kind of insight into what we're trying to do. Uh, and also with uh, economists. I remember my students were terrified at working with economists. I don't know if we've got any economists in the room. I know you economists have been doing some really interesting, uh, the, the economists have been doing some really interesting work uh, actually in the city of Sheffield as well, looking at new paradigms for new economies for, for Sheffield as a city. When, um, when uh, this uh, guy from the Economics Foundation came into the studio, students were absolutely terrified that he'd trashed their projects. And he was, he was amazed. He said, I can't, I didn't know architects thought like this. I didn't know they had ideas like this. And that might not work now, but in the future, with the policy change here, or this, that, there, this could work. And this is why we have to think big. Am I, um, sorry. I can shout if you like, I've got quite an hour, but can you, you probably all hear me without this. to kind of look at that. So maybe um, uh, these, these ideas are all, all kind of uh, building. It's, it's, it's important that we try and project ourselves into the future um, and, uh, and think what might happen in the next 15 or 20 or 25 years. Uh, it's also uh, very important to understand the decision-making processes that are going on in local councils, that are going on uh, at central government and that are going on um, visibly in front of us um, <coughs> today. And, and then this thing that is at the base of everything I'm talking about, that transformation can only happen and communities can only be built through a process of cooperation and participation. Um, an example of narrative, and narrative I think is a very powerful tool to use uh, when you're talking with uh, people who are maybe g uh, undergoing a big change in their, in, in, in their area. It can explore the possibilities uh, that they might not have thought of, but it's written in an unthreatening way, in a kind of open-ended story. Um, it can be used as a kind of catalyst to just get people thinking, get them to think through their memories, and if, again, the research has been done right, um, and, it can, and it can get people to think about their experiences uh, in a more thematic way. And, uh, and I think it's really important. And here's just an example, very quickly, of a project we did trying to revision Connorsborough, a very interesting uh, place because it had the Earth Centre there, which failed. And it failed the most, possibly the most interesting Millennium project. And you were all quite young when it happened. doesn't seem very long ago, the Millennium to us. The Earth Centre was this... Does anyone know, who knows about the Earth Centre? Yeah, not many of you. Well, the Earth Centre was a millennium project uh, that was talking about what life might be like in the future. It had some really new, well-designed buildings. It had some rather esoteric exhibitions. And it was a place that you would come and visit. And the idea was you got off the train from London. Maybe you could get a boat or uh, hire a bike down uh, and arrive at the Earth Centre. Um, a lot of thought, a lot of enormously sophisticated thought went into building. It's still there. All these redundant buildings are still there in Consborough, not very far away from here. Um, 
completely unused. And the reason it didn't work is they didn't involve or consult the community enough, in my mind, because we worked in Conisborough afterwards. And then uh, often uh, a studio project starts after we've actually worked in a community. So what the students did, and I just want to show this as a, an overarching idea, they, they thought what really um, big, powerful ideas might help Conisborough, which has had a very auspicious past. You know, lots of things were invented in Conisborough. It had various industries. It's got a wonderful castle. Um, it's, a, it's a really rather pretty historical centre, uh, but it's really beleaguered. They took it off the national grid, that's the unplugged bit. They rethought education, education's very poor there. Um, they all chose particular projects, that all built together to make a place. And this is at the, the heart of the way we work, is to, you choose something you're interested in to develop, something whether it ends up as a particular kind of school or an interesting thing, and all the projects build together to revision or reimagine the place. Uh, public realm is something that wasn't thought about very much there, so a lot of effort was put into public realm. The, the civic offices became uh, partly a power station, so power and the generation of power, um, and this is becoming an important dialogue in Stocksbridge with us. Uh, the generation of power became a real community neighbourhood thing to pull everyone together. Um, and then thinking about the beginning of life and the end of life, often sort of uh, particularly the end of life, very neglected areas. Uh, and they did this big kind of sweeping panorama to show all the main ideas, and then they did their projects from that. <clears throat> now I just want to talk a little bit about utopia. I don't want to get too uh, tied down in it. Um, we used Thomas More's utopia as a starting point when we used it in a project. Uh, largely, <coughs> its power <coughs> is in its humanity and its, its breadth of subject matter that really sort of contained all that's necessary for life. But the overriding symbol of utopia is dialogue. And this is really interesting because this makes, although in a way it's a communist manifest manifesto, uh, people and dialogue is at the heart of it. Uh, this kind of Socratic concept is kind of really relevant to architects who all learn about the polis and the idea of uh, developing ideas for society through dialogue. And again, this is at the heart of our relationship, our reciprocal relationship with people. <clears throat> the projects have a dialogue with and respond to the individual, the real personalities in a place, and then the collective and the civic. And this is mirrored in the way that students work, again, individually and as a whole. So as I've sort of just explained, students' projects <clears throat> all had to be negotiated within the wider whole of a neighbourhood or maybe a town. As in any society, it is the combination of the individual and the collective that is more than the sum of the parts. Utopian thinking not only freed the students from spatial restrictions, but also allowed or demanded a political stance and an understanding of ethics and principles. <clears throat> it can also lead to kind of dystopic imagery, testing out ideas, um, it can also lead to the, uh, we actually visited this, uh, which was a little utopian idea of Port Merion in Wales. I'm sure many of you might have visited it or been there. It's now just a little tourist vignette, but actually the ideas behind Clough Ellis's Port Merion was to actually build a functioning, autonomous place that really worked as a, as a neighbourhood and community. <coughs> um, also, um, I've used in my work quite a lot, and, and in the students' work, the idea of garden cities. They've been out of favour for a long time, Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities for tomorrow. It was, uh, it was actually a major influence, and again, it rings a chord, and it rung a chord uh, in the project that um, uh, I'll talk about in North Sheffield. Um, it's this kind of deep-seated understanding of landscape and its importance to regeneration. But the main critique of uh, Howard's uh, idea of uh, kind of his utopia, if you like, his garden cities of tomorrow, uh, was that it was bringing the city to the countryside, which perhaps now we're wanting to bring ideas of the country to the city. Uh, and with this kind of rural nostalgia associated with the landscape and countryside, it's very kind of English, 
kind of Englishness about it. But it is a kind of bourgeois construction of history where the general population have little interest in um, conservationism and, they, uh, and, and it's much more kind of visionary. <coughs> Peter Hall, who, uh, the well-known planner, he feels this is an underestimation of Howard's social ideas. And there is now a resurgent interest uh, in the whole idea of what a garden city could be. The ones, in fact, that were built remain only a part project because what they failed to get to grips with was the whole social and economic um, uh, basis of the fact that uh, they were a whole in time. I'm sure many of you know this. They were a whole in, entire kind of working, living, uh, leisure, everything, and in many cases, our garden cities are mainly just housing. <coughs> so, um, one of the, the student projects uh, using these ideas, uh, I'm just going to now follow a dialogue with three participants in the project that we actually wrote down at the time to talk about it, and I thought it was better than me sort of uh, be talking about it. And. Uh, um, a PhD student who was involved in the studio says, uh, who actually uh, participated in the studio, she said, we cited the studio interventions on an island site in a post-industrial northern England in order to focus the investigation and ground us in a spatial, political and economic reality. Located just outside the city of Wakefield on a brownfield site, the proposed new town encompasses and transforms an existing water system of wetlands, canal and river, infrastructure and industry, including an open cast mine and a landfill site. And it respects existing land use policy, including a designated nature reserve. The student's site investigations included more traditional cartographic approaches, but also more performative interactions with the landscape and the environment. And uh, a group of them went on an overnight visit and they camped there. Uh, that was, um, they weren't discovered, but they could well have been because it's near a landfill site, which has quite high security. Um, they focused around the existing buildings, uh, which were still on the site, the only buildings that were left on the site, and kind of used it, uh, imagining what it could be like as the centre of a new uh, neighbourhood, a new community that could build up around this place. They worked as a group imagining and performing the occupation of this environment, and proposed the starting point of the new town might be the construction of a productive landscape run by a community collective. The project's developed within the collectivity authored scenario for an eco-town, but also as a discrete building design project for each student. Ideas for new industry became an important part of the narrative of the new settlement, which was then called Welbeck. And virtually all of the 12 projects had an element of the land and ecology about them. As well as seeing built environment, landscape and ecology as interdependent and developing a design process which allowed individual project work to feed iteratively into the wider master plan. And vice versa, the studio also positioned building as an interrelated process involving economic strategy, micropolitics and local cultures. Students were encouraged to question the role that designers might play in the development of, development of a utopian settlement, perhaps imagining what role they might play in making their drawn and imagined visions into a reality, and reflecting on the difficulties and probable changes that would take place in a collectively constructed settlement that developed over many years. Now, the thing about this project was they couldn't consult with the community because the community didn't exist yet. So they had to use their past ideas and past work they'd done in live projects uh, and their own. They put themselves in the position of building a community in this, in this particular instance. And so the kind of collective um, new settlement grew um, and it grew very much, as I said, through these kind of landscape, actually, landscape ideas. Uh, and then certain buildings that became really important uh, to the collective vision of what a kind of civic society might be like. Uh, places for making, places for recycling and reusing, and all the kind of things that might make up a new type of high street, which is very much about recycling and reusing, uh, and, and 
going to collect something that you've handed in and comes back looking new kind of place rather than everything being uh, <clears throat> from a kind of consumer society. A lot was about the production of energy from various different sources, from agriculture and capturing various energy, and a lot was about health. Uh, this one was about using local plants uh, and growing it to actually provide the basis for a new type of health centre. Okay, the final student project, I want to go back to the Stocksbridge, uh, if you can remember that, and uh, I talked about how it's now, this project has, has been absolutely vital in how the residents are kind of starting to perceive their projects that they're developing now that we can explore through this research project. <coughs> they were looking to develop an ideal neighbourhood. And um, it's very difficult to, you, you can, in theory, you can look at what an ideal neighbourhood is. And they used utopian models again. Um, but this time, there's an existing community there, so they could actually go out and test their ideas. They could, uh, uh, they could present uh, what might be needed to turn Stocksbridge into an ideal neighbourhood, all the new types of building, all the new um, types of work and leisure and things that could, you could, in this imaginative project, provide. Um, they also made it very clear that this was, in reality, an impossibility, but we were there to dream. The collective model sort of became an imaginary mechanism that ultimately led uh, not to a built reality, but the students building their projects and their built reality. It collectively experimented with the relationships of scale, materiality, form and context. And the holistic knowledge gained became invaluable. Um, and it became invaluable because they could gather this information actually by showing their work to the residents of Stocksbridge. And again, they wrote narratives, uh, which were a combination of the past of the place, new stories of the present and future, needs of the place. Um, there was a very famous uh, umbrella factory there, in fact, the first kind of umbrella factory, uh, very finely engineered. This led to a lot of thought about new buildings that could come from that, for example. Uh, there's a big empty valley there, with, um, which could be used to uh, harvest timber and a new timber college was developed by one student, a new station, which actually is an idea that's uh, gaining momentum to actually reconstruct the railway from Sheffield to Stocksbridge. Stocksbridge is quite far out, it's about 10 miles out of Sheffield, but still part of Sheffield, it's kind of eccentric edge community. The stories gathered highlighted that the industry is not only a huge part of the economic viability of the community, it has a huge role in the socio-political development of the neighbourhood networks, as well as uh, identifying things like the high street as being at the heart of, uh, of many local neighbourhoods, very much small individual neighbourhood shops. And one of the students said what we all struggled with was successfully representing the individual without compromising on the collective's uh, ideas of the whole neighbourhood. It was only by telling stories that wove into our personal responses to the ideal neighbourhood that we could co-author the narrative for our own neighbourhood in the future. The final story included all the stakeholders within the neighbourhood. It included the industry, the civic institutions, the new places to learn and work, new paradigms for off-grid energy, new ways to spend time, and new ways to travel to and from a new Stocksbridge and out into the Peak District. What transpired? Um, very early kind of ideas of how you might make, just, just to test ideas, nothing like actually stops with, but what transpired was definitely not a utopia, uh, but it was definitely a much better kind of place to be. And uh, um, an enormous model that was made uh, of the whole area where things have constantly been added and changed is now a central discussion point for the whole community. Uh, unbelievably contentious, as you can probably imagine, was all the wind power that the students put on the model when they took it to the, that this started and became uh, an enormously contentious point about wind power in Stocksbridge because they've had certain problems with it. I was uncomfortable with this. It's interesting, the sociologists who I'm working with, now this model has become part of the research project, say it's fine to to really bring up very, very contentious 
things where a lot of people are very upset. Mm -hmm. at, whenever they see something fixed on a model, they think this might actually happen. It's not just a discussion point. And wind power is definitely, they see it as an encroachment uh, on their valley. The Stockbridge is actually in a valley. And um, although there's pylons, go all the way, they, they've learned to live with the pylons, they don't see them, but they, um, but they definitely are not interested in wind power. And that, that possibly was one single event and discussion that we had uh, with the community there that led to them being very interested in developing the scientific ideas behind solar power and how we can develop it and develop what's happening in the university there in Stocksbridge. Um, all these things are really complex. I'm only being able to uh, um, really touch lightly on this. And I, you know, I'm very happy. You've all been very quiet, and I thought you were really noisy, so I don't know whether that's a bad or a good thing. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll now just uh, finish off by uh, talking. How much longer do you want me to talk for? It's quarter past. It's quarter past, and you've got to do one. So Does anybody want to ask any questions? Sleep before. Yeah. I was because um, I, I, I've seen that model, and when I saw it, I don't think there was any wind turbines on it. I, were they taken off for a reason? They were taken off. Well, they were taken off. Yeah, because the like, community didn't want them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it was like, through the project to decide to. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and you know, as as long as you keep something open ended, and say this is just an idea. You know, communities can work with that, but it has to be done really, really carefully. Um, I think, I'm now going to talk about a, a, a project in a place called Cantlow. I don't know if any of you know Cantlow. It's just the other side of the M1 as you go into Rotherham. <clears throat> it's both typical and unique of that post uh, first of all, 1930s and 1950s overspill, sub garden city in some cases. I'll talk about in the next project, but Canclo is particularly extreme. And you have no idea how extreme some of these communities are until you go into them. Um, here are just some things that have happened. Um, the snooker champion, Sean, I can't remember his surname now, anyway, came from Canclo. At the same time that he won, I think he won the World Sneaker Championships. What's his name? Sean Murphy. Murphy. That's it. Comes from Cancro. There were there were two murders in one small housing estate. You know, the shops there were a kind of a betting shop and a pound shop. No fresh food shop. Um, and what was recommended, and this is really uh, the story, the narrative behind the two next projects we're going to talk about is mass housing demolition. When a community is beleaguered and the, and the, the work is gone, it, it, what, seemed to, what seemed to be recommended by big um, reports done by interdisciplinary firms, none of which or whom had any kind of uh, architects or people wanting to build a better uh, place, well, everyone wants to build a better place, but I mean, uh, uh, but housing demolition seems to be the panacea for what happens. And that, that as you know, demolishes communities. And so um, we were given the opportunity to work with um, <coughs> a planner uh, and to try and, and uh, with a community forum. The community forums don't really exist anymore in the same way. The community forums had a community worker attached to them, and they were usually given a one or two year post and they, um, and they work with the community, uh, helping them with professionals uh, develop a vision for what they wanted in their neighbourhood. Uh, and we had a particularly good, she was a really, really good community worker um, on this. The trouble is, it's never long enough. You know, there's a two-year contract and then their contract ends and everything falls apart. In this case, we had three years to do this. And we gathered... Um, people from the community, which isn't an easy thing to do, and uh, we started working with them, and they became researchers. In the, in the same way that the, um, the people we're working with in Stocksbridge on this Solar Futures project um, are co-producers and they're project partners. They're not people who are being participated with or engaged with, they are actually project partners. Uh, and these people were paid 
uh, and, and care was arranged for them if they needed for their children and all the rest of it. And, and they, we worked with them over a period of three years and it, it was a really profoundly affecting experience for me. We took them on visits to places. This, these are typical views of camp though. Um, we worked with them developing bigger events that other members of the community come with, uh, trying to be as creative as possible with our participatory events, creating ideas um, <clears throat> that everyone could buy into, uh, to see what the community really needed to rebuild something which was successful and sustainable. Um, and I'll just go through these. Yes, uh, many people wanted a community garden. Um, <clears throat> People were interested in growing things but had no experience of knowledge or doing so. Um, this little boy, uh, you know, had never had a fresh carrot or so he told us. Whether his mother told us the same thing. Um, we got uh, members of the community, if this looks like a kind of first year model maybe. This is built not by us but by members of the community. Uh, they got really into it. They had a little bit of help cutting contours and things like that. Uh, this was a this was a, a communal activity. Uh, we then provided other kind of graphics, open-ended questions, asking, "Do you want a public space here? What could it look like? Does it need public art? What, uh, you know?" And discussing all these kind of issues. Uh, with this knowledge, this is a group um, of women uh, who'd all left school with no qualifications. Be, it, you brought greater confidence and greater sense of being in control. Um, and what I have to say about this project is, in many ways, it succeeded. Um, there is new housing being built there, and it's actually very, well, quite a good quality. And the architects who built it in the end did take our community vision on board. But many things didn't happen that they really wanted from this kind of uh, vision. Uh, neighbourhood vision that we eventually kind of recorded for them, their community vision, uh, with all these different elements, I apologise if you can't read these, you know, involving uh, new green homes, a new community facility. Uh, they were very interested in sustainability. We went to visit um, places like Hockerton, understanding the benefits of, of eco-communities. Uh, they were very receptive to this making cheaper ways of living for them as well as, um, as, well as actually having a genuine desire to be part of uh, new um, forms of energy that are less intrusive uh, on the carbon footprint. Um, while you're actually making things, it's actually developing a community hub. This is what they haven't got, their community hub, uh, which actually uh, is one of the most difficult buildings to actually create, is a community building, because of, there are so many. And, and I think Jenny sort of talked about it, of, of so many different types of people might want to use a, a, a whole neighbourhood, a community. Um, hi, yeah. yeah. Um, after a model is completed, what sort of people uh, are called upon to evaluate that model? Well, uh, actually, I'm just going to go right on to say that, because this is one of the massive successes of this. Through making models with people and, and saying, well, you know, sh you know the, the, the genuine kind of information giving and information listening, uh, we developed a whole series of these models with them. The community then put a PowerPoint together here are two of them. These are people who had never presented anything in their life. This was one of the most rewarding and empowering events. They put on a community forum where they invited all the local politicians, all the uh, local employers that might want to buy into a community building uh, to make it more viable. Um, they invited all the residents. We had about 100 people there. But it was basically a room full of policy makers uh, as well. And they did it. We didn't present it. The, the residents of Canclo actually presented it. During this process, which was a long process, I did a, an MArch studio there, and um, the students presented their projects again to the residents. Uh, the wackier the projects, the more they like them, I have to say. <laughs> it was amazing. These are some of the sort of more central ones, but this was one um, 
proposal for how the housing, this new kind of ubiquitous housing, uh, two bedroom semi housing that you see all around this area. Um, the wind cows are. Yep, on top of the little wind cows on top of the thing. Anyway, lots of interesting ideas there for the residents to look at. Another particularly one that I like was to turn the whole of Kanklo, and this is a plan of the whole of Kanklo, into a farm and um, with an agricultural college. Um, and uh, uh, lots of really interesting ideas came out of that one. And, and the residents kind of were inspired by that. They kept to their track of what they wanted, but it just helped them rethink of, of what, you know, what could happen in a place. The trouble is, one has to be very careful not to build up uh, over expectation of what can be achieved. Perhaps the most um, empowering thing that happened through this whole process um, was that four of the women went back to school and got A-levels. A a a that's amazing, isn't it? You know, from, um, but they didn't get their community hall. Uh, um, okay, so perhaps the biggest project that I've been um, involved with was this regeneration framework for North Sheffield. Um, and it came again from a very contentious issue. Now, this is David Blunkett's area, and so we had him as backing for this. But basically, another one of these reports was done which recommended enormous amounts of demolition. And there was a near riot, a, a near riot. These are all the uh, communities of Parsons Cross and Shirefield. It's a really large area, something like uh, 10,000 households live in this area of North Sheffield. It's, it's quite poor. Uh, they tend to put um, unmarried mothers with four children in houses out here where you, it actually costs quite a lot of money to get into the centre of town now. Um, and it's, it's kind of this same kind of housing with privet hedges at the front uh, and gardens at the back that people don't really know how to look after necessarily um, or want to look after. This started a whole kind of uh, regeneration uh, process. There was a very, um, very uh, um, intelligent and uh, ambitious regeneration officer who started this whole process. They started an arm's length company called SOAR, South in Alderton Neighbourhood Strategy. And we decided, uh, I was asked to get involved in it, we decided to uh, start a whole new process of a way of doing this, which would uh, be uh, participating with all the different communities. And I could talk about this for many hours, uh, and I won't. Um, but to go back to those ideas of garden cities, it's, a, it's all sort of sub-garden city in this area. If you look at the way Sheffield is made up, that's the city centre, and actually, uh, I thought it was actually on here, but I can't do it. But the, the, the area we're talking about is an area bigger than the city centre, straight to the north. Uh, of where this red is. You can see how much the landscape is really important <coughs> and the greenery inside the city boundaries uh, and the rivers and the topography is absolutely critical. And it's on two different hills, Fox Hill at the top, Shirecliff is on the first hill, there's Parson Cross, just, you know, it's a whole kind of landscape of its own. So uh, we were working with uh, landscape architects as well, Andrew Grant Associates and artists and um, community workers who were presenting and helping to enable all these workshops. An enormous number of people were involved in this. And the, the, we decided that we needed to use, uh, and we went to the residents with these first ideas, uh, use the topography and develop big ideas that come from what's special about Salvi and Allerton. And really it's, it's people, it's community networks, it's size, it's topography, the views and the special kind of landscapes. Um, <clears throat> this is post rationalising, this was in the report at the end, but this was kind of the process we went through. We thought that opportunity for people there, which is enormously lacking, building the communities sort of four generations of unemployment uh, in some families, and the ecology with three really important themes. We then needed tools with which to work with people to develop their neighbourhood <coughs> strategies. <clears throat> and those tools were developing our own big ideas and taking them to the public, developing neighbourhood diagrams, 
uh, for people to discuss with, developing neighbourhood identities and then developing development principles. And uh, we also thought of other ideas and narratives that actually what that place is all about is technology, things are being made there, um, and the nature that's there. And so we consulted on many different themes over many different sort of big events over a number of years. <coughs> And I'll just kind of really go through this. This kind of really sums up the idea. You could find places like this in that area that are completely neglected and overgrown and not used. Um, we had ideas for energy that you could have, again, wind power on the top of the hill, solar power on the, on the slopes of the hills, and, and obviously water power in the valleys. Uh, we developed <coughs> individual neighbourhood diagrams for each of these areas became a, a really enormous uh, kind of enterprise. But behind it all was this part, these, sorry, these different ideas that kind of made it all hang together. And, I, and what's really reassuring is this, now this framework document is, is eight years old, nearly 10 years old, and it's still being used. It's sort of been used in Norfolk Park, it's been used in, uh, even in Park Hill, this idea of the landscape around it. That, Sheffield really is a park city. It's open spaces forming a green web across the area that connects the community, and it should connect the community facilities, the hubs, and the neighbourhood centres. And you can see them developing there. This idea of see and be seen, the ridges and edges linking to make major features that actually you can't tell, and I bet none of you can tell what hill is what when you're looking from certain angles of Sheffield. How, how can we actually make these more visible? The identity that comes from the land form there, um, the lots of kind of long routes through it actually, from city to country and back again, uh, really building on these uh, kind of routes that go through the area. <coughs> uh, and then these actual green arteries, the routes that actually become the centres for activity. And when we actually mapped these, they were the neighbourhood centres are already there. Um, the enormous success of this project. There are many things that were kind of interesting about this project um, and it's been used as a case study for lots of other big regeneration projects. Uh, but the, 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 one of the things that was most successful about it was how many people participated in it. There was a lot of arguing. We needed very careful mediation at many of the sessions. It was really difficult. Uh, the council were very proactive and they, they had money to spend. They got a lot of European money and at least 40 projects have happened in this area. Small parks have been regenerated, uh, work units, new housing. So the housing has been the most difficult, sheltered housing. Um, but perhaps the most successful, if you drive around here, are some of the neighborhood centers. Um, a lot of them, again, were just like Cancler. They had no fresh food. They had the things that, uh, Poor impoverished neighbourhoods uh, have a lot uh, chemist shops, pound shops, um, uh, and you know no vibrancy to the uh, to, to the neighbourhood centres. And if you go up to Parson Cross now, uh, supermarkets wouldn't go there. Tesco's refused to go there. Uh, the regeneration officers spent a lot of their time trying to persuade supermarkets to go there. We're always trying to stop them going to places. <laughs> But that they were seen as a way that you could build community. And, uh, and if you go up there now, there's a new library built by Norwegian architects. There's a, an Asda store. There's a new school. Uh, and all this, I'm not saying if, you know, there are other forces um, behind it, but the neighborhood centers have really been rejuvenated. And something, uh, again, we worked on a smaller scale was our own, and just to make a few more points, and I'm nearly coming to an end now, um, is Norfolk Park. There was a, a, a little competition for a green homes, uh, really a little new neighbourhood of totally sustainable housing. Um, and uh, it was a very kind of uh, eccentric developer who was doing it. And in the end, we didn't win. We came second. Uh, but quite a lot of our ideas were used in the scheme that's actually being built. Uh, and we worked uh, with the architects that actually built it um, <coughs> in the end. And um, we worked with uh, the colleague, which now left Sheffield University, and author of the book that I 
told the example of the Windy site on Norfolk Park, who had done an extensive kind of consultation in Norfolk Park. And um, we decided that before we even, in this competition, before we even put pen to paper about building, we had to see what communities were there and to try and build a community, if you like, before you suggest the houses that should be built there. And we thought about what could happen locally. Um, <clears throat> I'll allow you to read this. Um, can you read it? Yeah. Um, we we uh, use the information uh, that Simone has got about the community-based organisations, and we kind of get an, again built kind of scenarios and, and little narratives about it. And we put the people that might want to move into there that already live in Norfolk Park because they were taking down down uh, a number of the high rises, some of which which were very popular. Um, what became more important were these little, uh, that we learned from the project in Canclo and things like that, is these little neighbourhood projects at the centre, perhaps somewhere where you recycle furniture, perhaps somewhere where you just put your recycling, perhaps a little community forum uh, is actually as important and where that goes in a housing area. We took a lot of notice of the wind uh, on that site and we developed what we thought was a little ideal sustainable neighbourhood. Uh, we've used this, and you architects have probably seen these drawings, uh, Howard's beautiful drawings, who uh, I'm in practice with, not the, not the model, but the drawings to come. And uh, we've also talked a lot to communities about this, that it's not just about the housing, it's the circulation and the transport, sustainable circulation and transport, it's kind of all suds and car shares, it's the routes through, it's the open spaces uh, that are incredibly um, important. It's the views. Every time you're talking about anything in Sheffield, views has to come into the conversation. Uh, otherwise, you're not maximising, as some of the PFI schools did, and they're not maximising the potential of, um, of what you can do in Sheffield. Um, but it's the core of that recycling meeting place that's absolutely crucial. And um, again, it became, in a way, the ecology and the landscape uh, that was always is, and often, and landscape architects, you were landscape architects, you always know, is often um, the thing that gets cut in, a, in a, um, a public housing scheme before it's done. And we put that centrally to... Um, to what this sustainable neighbourhood could, could be. Uh, and it tied together, it tied together all the units. For example, uh, you know, there were collective ideas about growing fruit and vegetables as well as, as, well as the irrigation systems, uh, the sub system and, uh, and the, the all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of kind of innovative ways of catching uh, sunlight and catching the views is what, uh, all these kind of natural elements that build practically towards uh, a kind of successful, very livable, sustainable community. So sort of running out of steam now because all these things you could talk about for so long. But I just want to um, end by saying um, I wanted a bit of a rest to kind of write up something that can make much more sense of, of what we've been doing. But um, uh, in this kind of neoliberal kind of uh, initiative we're in at the moment with the coalition, um, and their kind of policy towards neighbourhood planning, uh, it's almost impossible to actually build a building if you're an architect. Only few, and often the very big practices, are actually managing to build. But we were asked to um, go and uh, help a community that had won some money uh, from this new neighbourhood um, uh, these, these, this neighbourhood initiative, uh, the coalition's initiative, to see what would actually help build their community more. And they had a, um, and uh, we're actually just doing this, this this week, these are some of the very early drawings we've produced. We've gone through the same process again, of gathering as much information as we can, meeting as many people, and making a decision uh, a very simple decision of are we going to uh, refurbish an existing sports centre or build something entirely new? And now the residents have got to decide what they can do. 
So we're moving beyond architecture and the traditional form of procurement if you, uh, at the moment as architects. Um, communities are applying for money and then you have to go through this whole process with them uh, before, there's, there's, there's more layers, I, I'm finding it difficult to describe this, there's more layers involved in actually getting from what a community wants to actually achieving a project and there's less money and less know-how to do it. We in Canclo didn't ever achieve because housing market renewal and another government policy came in. We didn't ever achieve um, a community building there which was going to be paid for by the new housing. Oh hi, okay. yeah. Uh, what happened then with the community? As you, like, did you leave them or are you still working with them? What, in Canclo? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, in Canclo, uh, it fit the whole scheme finished and so we couldn't work with them anymore. Uh, housing market renewal uh, took over from these kind of community forums and that was very much in the uh, gift of the council again and, and that went to big firms of architects to provide that housing. And we, they were lucky that they got some good quality housing there, but they didn't get their community garden you know, in the middle of the, or, or their, they might have got that now, actually. Um, we, we're waiting to find out. I need to go, I want to go back there and do a kind of post-occupancy of it, because I think that would be, is the most interesting thing. So few times do we actually go back and see what's happened after all, all these schemes. But just the point I wanted to make, just before I end, is that actually it's, uh, particularly in some of these northern industrial cities, it's on sports that actually bring communities together and are the most sustainable part of any, of any community. It gets the parents together, it gets the children together, it gets different cultures together in sport. And it's no coincidence that this project near Castlewood in Yorkshire is a sports centre. And the community have already uh, decided themselves, the residents and people who run this sports centre, that they want it to be much more than that. They want it to be a community library, they want it to be an information centre, they want it to be somewhere they can encourage people in. So, um, and then none of this is new, but it makes for very interesting new building types that actually, you know, a building can actually be uh, like libraries have been in the past and, you know, and how. Uh, contested is that at the moment as library is shut and um, I think this is because the, their local library is shut that they want to create a new community library in the sports centre so this idea of this kind of cross programmed buildings I think is incredibly important in the building of, of new successful communities um, and because I'm an architect I wanted to show you a building just to finish to say that we did achieve a building, a community building, um, and it's the Hillsborough Pavilion, if any of you live in Hillsborough goes Pavilion, it's a bowling club, and um, I'm only really showing this um, because, again, it was done fully participatory with the, with the bowlers, uh, we wanted to create something that they could bowl inside, so it's got a big block on the back, and yet they're a very successful crown bowling <coughs> community, but it is the main community pastime for an age group in Hillsborough, which is almost exclusively white working class. Um, it's been to an enormous kind of satisfaction that this one building, that we tried to make it, we refused and, and absolutely refused to put um, uh, uh, screens up to protect it against vandalism. They said it would be vandalised. It's never been vandalised. Uh, we. Uh, we've kept it as open as possible so you can see through. We, we fought and fought and fought for more and more glass, for more and more roof lights, because sports centres are often, if ever you've been into any sports centre, Sport England, who funded this, um, don't like windows, have to be high level, everything has to have grills, and we fought against this and against this. And as a result of that, we actually managed to achieve nice little spaces to sit, although I have to say, this has been removed on the ground so it passed every building regulations and then it was removed because they thought children might climb on it and throw themselves over but uh, notwithstanding that the public toilets are still there with beautiful roof lights um, it's light it's used by many different community groups not just the bowlers it has tea dances uh, there are every day there are different groups of 
disabled and multicultural groups coming in from outside to use this building. And so um, it was enormously hard work to achieve this building. It was, you had to fight all the way to kind of protect some of the things you want and to make it work. And the downside is we had to use really cheap timber, which is now suffering a bit. It's six years, five years old, this building. But a building takes that amount of time to come into its own skin. And I just want to leave you, and there are lots of things I haven't said, and you can ask me some intelligent questions, um, with the thought that space, to go back to the thought that any community needs a space to be comfortable in. And the more carefully thought about that space is to use it for everybody uh, and to include as many groups as possible. The more successful, the more viable, and the more sustainable, uh, not just that building is going to be, but that community is going to be.